right now. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Um, uh, this is the, the second community call for Dapper in July. Uh, glad to have you with, with us. Uh, my name is uh, Ori Zohar, I'm a PM in the team working on Dapper. Uh, we got uh, some interesting stuff in the agenda today. Let me share my screen real quick. Just to go over the agenda today. So let me know when you can see it. Um, yeah, so today um, we're going to go over some of the highlights of um, the version 0.9 that was just released last week. A uh, quick update on some of the stuff we're going to do with samples. Um, then your own is going to share some uh, um, insights coming out of a security audit we had, uh, very interesting stuff. Um, Vinaya is going to lead a open community discussion on uh, retry policies that Dapper has, and we really want to get your feedback and, and see uh, uh, kind of how we can build this uh, with uh, users in mind. Uh, Mark Tamarni is going to demo some of the, one of the new features coming out of Point Nine, which is scheduling with Chrome binding. Uh, and have a note on on some stuff coming up uh, with cloud events. And as usual, we'll have an open Q&A at the end. Leave some time for, for anything you want to talk about, whether it's features, questions, uh, and so on. So uh, with that, um, by the way, uh, as always, you're welcome to raise your hand uh, if you want to be unmuted. But feel free to, to use the chat to ask questions. and. Um, and kind of uh, engage uh, during this community call. We really want to hear from you um, as well. So, just starting with the um, uh, with the uh, Dapper uh, version zero point nine. Um, let me just real quick. And can you see my screen? By the way, I'm kind of assuming you can. At this point. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, if we go to um, just go to the Dapper repo real quick. Um, so as always, we got the release notes um, out there, and, and for point nine, we had like quite a few things that the team has been working on. We're really excited about, um, and I hope you you got the chance to upgrade and play with it a little bit. But uh, uh, we introduced some new components: uh, the Chrome um, scheduling. Uh, binding that uh, Mark is going to demo later, a PostgreSQL uh, state store that was uh, contributed from, uh, from from a user, which is great. Um, some additional, um, um, you know, iterative uh, updates to the to the dashboard that can uh, now be deployed with Helm, and uh, also there's a CLI command that helps you bring that up. And uh, if you attended the previous calls. Uh, Will shared. Uh, Will and Chad shared some some of the stuff that we're doing, and we're going to you're going to see more of that coming soon. Um, some additional kind of uh, changes in the CLI and in it, uh, including the ability to um, deploy or initialize Dapper rather uh, without a Docker dependency, which is something that uh, some users have been asking for, uh, which is great uh, that we can we can have that now. Um, as you know, Dapper does not have a dependency with Docker, but we try to uh, give you like a really good experience um, spinning up some containers that help you get started, like a Redis store and so on. So now you can do that without that. If for some reason you don't have Docker uh, or uh, you just uh, don't want that dependency. Additionally, some support for, uh, for the state store for uh, transactional um, uh, uh, components that's uh, really opening the door for using Azure Cosmos DB for, for actors, uh, which is also something that I was asked by some um, uh, customers, people using it. Uh, I mentioned the CLI uh, dashboard commands. Uh, another cool uh, component is the local development secret store, another contribution uh, that is um, this kind of uh, local secret store, uh, which is, in a way, it's kind of like a simulation of a secret store. Uh, uh, secrets are not really stored, uh, are not encrypted or anything. But this is super helpful for uh, you know, the development stage when you're working with secret stores and you just want to have a quick uh, secret store to, uh, to use. And then, of course, when you deploy to production, you can 
uh, transition to a different component like uh, HashiCorp Vault or Azure Key Vault or whatever. Um, so that's a, a great contribution I feel is, uh, I know for myself is really uh, useful as well. Um, and then some changes in the init and uninstall behavior, which, which are breaking changes. So we want to make sure that um, you, you take note of that. So as always, uh, look at the release notes, uh, check out the breaking changes especially are important. Um, and, um, and yeah, I don't know if we have any questions on that on the chat, but uh, um, let me know. Um, and for now, uh, let me just give a quick update on some of the stuff you might be seeing in the few new, new uh, for the next few weeks uh, in the samples repo. So as you can see, I know a lot of people, that's kind of how they're introduced to Dapper and they use these samples that we got to get you started really quickly. So just so you know, we're very devoted to having these samples useful and um, always up to date. What's happening is that we're, we're having a lot of features and we're seeing some great uh, additions to those samples, but at some point uh, we got some feedback that this is becoming a little confusing and we also wanna have a path for adding additional samples that might not be uh, the first thing you do on Dapper, but are very useful further on. So we're actually gonna be separating those um, uh, to two different kind of samples. So. Um, you're going to see another repo called Quick Starts, where we're going to kind of take uh, a few of these hello world and kind of basic uh, samples that uh, use the and show the building blocks like PubSub and binding. Uh, and we're going to kind of keep them separately, making sure they're always good for every release. Uh, and then you're going to see the samples repo transition to having uh, additional samples. Uh, but are not uh, are kind of more of a best effort, always up to date. Each one's going to say which version of Dapper it's working with. Um, but then we'll, we're going to have a really great repo that we're hoping is really going to grow and have like a lot of different use cases and so on. So again, we're going to keep kind of the, the getting started, quick start uh, samples in, in one place and and um, and have the rest of the samples over there. So. Uh, if you have, um, if part of the, if you're a contributor and you're, uh, um, you know, writing a how-to and you want to show some code with that, uh, that's a great place for that, as well as showing some applications of, of scenarios uh, and so on. Um, so, with that, I'll kind of uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, feel free to ask questions about that or have comments on it uh, in the chat. Uh, and if there aren't any, I'll kind of kick it over to your own uh, talking about um, the security audit we just had. Yeah, thanks, Ori. So I'll share my screen and let me know when you can see it. We see it. All right, great. So as part of our production readiness 1.0 release, uh, we want to make sure that security is one of the things that uh, we take a very uh, close look into. And as part of that and part of the ongoing work that we did, uh, we hired a CNCF approved company called Cure53, uh, which did a number of uh, testing and penetration tests and um, that kind of stuff for uh, CNCF projects uh, to, take, to, to get an early look of Dapper before 1.0 and we're probably gonna do another one right before the release. And um, this report, which we're very briefly gonna go over, um, is actually available. So in the uh, spirit of transparency, of course, and visibility into uh, everything about Dapper, we merged the PR today into the docs. So if you go into uh, docs and then concept and security and you scroll down or uh, press the security audit June 2020 link here, uh, you'll see a brief section regarding the security audit and you can find the full report here and take a look at it. So the things that uh, we covered during the security audit were quite extensive. Um, there was a full uh, code base evaluation for the Dapper runtime uh, and the components code. So not only Dapper Dapper, but also the uh, components contrib repository and also the CLI code. Um, we tested for things like privilege uh, escalation, uh, traffic spoofing, taking a look at how Dapper manages secrets um, across all of our secret stores really. Uh, so HashiCorp Key Vault and Azure, uh, sorry, HashiCorp Vault and Azure Key Vault and Kubernetes and a bunch of others. Uh, we took a look at RBAC settings and uh, RBAC configuration that Dapper has for Kubernetes. 
uh, we did some uh, base assumption validations to you know um, be able to uh, verify that MTLS is actually uh, encrypting um, the the traffic uh, in transit that scopes are working that components can be scoped that API authentication is working uh, Dapper has token based authentication from the app to Dapper uh, we took a look at how do you deploy Dapper into Kubernetes and orchestration hardening um, policies uh, with some advices on that. We tried to uh, perform DOS attacks and did penetration testing. So there's a lot of stuff that happened during, um, there actually that whole month of the security audit. And um, as the, the full report can be found here, the things to notice, and I'm gonna, just gonna give you a very brief summary because we don't have a lot of time. Um, so we found one critical and one high issue uh, during the audit, we fixed it. And so currently, the current state is, um, as of today, Dapper has zero criticals, two highs, two mediums, one low and one info. Um, if you wanna help us fix those issues or you have opinions about them, you can always go to the Dapper Dapper um, repository and filter by labels that have security on them. And there you can see all the issues. So uh, what we did was after we got the security report, we took all of those items and we convert them into GitHub issues, which we will tackle before the 1.0 release. Uh, by the way, uh, just, you know, if, if you're wondering out of curiosity before you read the report, um, the critical and, and the high issue that were closed were actually not due to something that was in the Dapper runtime. It was due to a configuration in the Helm chart. So I don't know if you're um, using Helm, and uh, to, to parameterize your Kubernetes deployments, but please make sure that you go over them and that you don't have any misconfigurations. For example, make sure that you're not using uh, or assigning cluster role bindings instead of role bindings, um, because uh, those things can um, sort of get away very easily and they're pretty hard to track. So that was the thing that we fixed. And uh, the rest of the um, identified issues are all in this report here, which you can find. If you really want an executive summary of it, I suggest you read the introduction and scope sections in addition to the conclusions part. So the conclusions uh, found out that um, according to the report, Dapper has been built with security in mind um, and the code base has been evaluated as solid. Um, and again, those vulnerabilities are into GitHub issues and if you wanna help uh, solve them, or if you have opinions about any of them. Um, for example, if you think that a high should be a critical or a critical should be a high or whatever, um, we'd love to hear from you. So if you wanna take a look at that, um, then that's great. Uh, we'll probably have one more uh, review like that before the 1.0 release to make sure that we addressed everything on here and that um, no new um, high or critical vulnerabilities have been added. Um, since June and the time where 1.0 comes out. So that's it, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, awesome, Yaron, thank you so much. Um, yeah, as Yaron said, like the commitment, we have a great commitment to security. We definitely see that as a high priority towards the version 1.0. So it's great to see, um, you know, those issues come up. You always, I mean, you want some issues to come up just to, because there's always issues, but not too many. And it's great to get that uh, external validation as well. As Yaron said, that's a third party that uh, gave us an audit. And we're going to be doing some more of those. Um, yeah, next up, uh, Vinaya, uh, take it away. Uh, talk about retries. Sure. So thanks, Zori. Uh, yeah, so this section is going to be about getting your opinion on how we should implement retries in Dapper. So let me first explain how we have implemented it so far and then we can open it and like have an open discussion to see what, like how we should do it. Uh, so currently there are two types of retries that are implemented in Dapper. One is like an application level retries, which are with, like the retries is configurable by the user on a per call basis. But this uh, retry logic applies only for state, uh, state APIs. It, it's not implemented for any other building blocks. And the second type of retries is the internal retries, where, uh, which is implemented in the service invocation case. So where if the caller side dapper is make, trying to make a call to the callee side and it's not able to reach for some reason, it will retry. So 
uh, we wanted to like open this up to you guys and to check with you what is your opinion on how we should whether we should implement the retry logic consistently across all the building blocks or whether it should be like an application level concern and uh, so one way we were thinking of implementing it is moving the retry logic and dapper runtime to the like to the middleware that way then the retry logic would be consistent across all the building blocks another approach to this could be like leave it to the user code and let the user code handle it and dapper doesn't implement it at all so yeah i would love to open your like ha listen to your thoughts on this and Oh, Yaron, is there anything that you would like to add before we open it up? Yeah, no, I think uh, you touched on the main point, which is um, retries are, are really um, a, a user code type of thing to many developers. So um, th there are a few things that we need to take into consideration here. For example, if there's uh, some network partition between the user code and Dapper, that's unlikely to happen because Dapper always uh, is encouraged to run uh, next year process, whether it is in inside the same pod, which means inside the same node in the case of Kubernetes. Um, so if you have retry policies in your user code and you're basically saying, hey, Dapper will not do ever do retries. And if a call um, fails in Dapper, for example, to save state, then it's my user's code responsibility to retry it. That's something that uh, I think is, is fair to say um, that's doable. There are many SDKs and retry policies for most of the program languages out there. And so I think developers um, might find it natural to do that. Um, of course, it means that um, you're, let's say, quote unquote, wasting a network hop if, you're, um, if your application code is retrying for Dapper. So you're, you're, instead of having Dapper retry, you're not saving that um, extra hop between your app and Dapper. So I think that's, that might be a downside there. Um, Dapper can do retries, for example, like we do for state, let's say for PubSub. So if you publish a message, you'll be able to um, tell Dapper, hey, you know what, for publishing this um, message for this given topic, I want you to retry five times with a threshold of, um, I don't know, uh, 600 milliseconds for all the calls with um, a retry algorithm of exponential or something like that. So it's really about whether you um, as developers want to see your application handle retries because you know how to do it best and you have SDKs and libraries that you prefer to use, or if you want um, Dapper to do uh, the retries also on your behalf. Um, and so we're, we're pretty um, excited to hear what you have to say because to be honest, we don't know. Right, um, we we don't like the maintainers of Dapper. We don't want to be um, taking a decision that's not based on um, user feedback, and so we're opening up for discussion here. And of course, that discussion can be continued over Gitter, over GitHub, um, and this is of course not the end of it. So that's just what I wanted to add. Yeah, you please raise your hand if you have anything to share. Yeah, we can unmute you if you raise your hand, or and I see a comment already from from George. Um, perhaps if when Dapper retries internally and fails, the application should know about that so it can reduce retry traffic. So how would you, um, George? How would you imagine that Dapper um, alerts the app in that case? Or how would the application know? Okay. Sure, so feel free to speak. I unmuted you. So, um, so in an exception. Okay. So to for example, today, um, where you call when you call Dapper, if Dapper fails to let's take the publish endpoint as an example, if you publish a message to Dapper, it will return an error to you. So in in that sense, I think you're more leaning towards the the keep it in user code side type of. Um, scenario where we mentioned. And um, Joseph, I got a message from you, but it's, uh, I, did you mean to send that to the entire group or just to me because I, I got it privately? And I see, uh, Kasun, you have your hand raised. So, feel free to speak. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, I have like two questions. Uh, so uh, when we are implementing something such as retry, we may also look at uh, other related patterns as well, such as circuit breakup, uh, because we may follow the same approach across all these uh, resiliency patterns. And uh, the second part of it is, uh, I see uh, there are a lot of uh, language level libraries to implement these things, such as Hysrix. Residence 4J and so on, but I think having it as part of the paper would be more useful for the developers, in my opinion. So those are two of my comments. Yeah. Okay, and you know, so I, I know Poly, for example, for .NET, um, which is a resiliency library to handle retries and stuff. And so the the question then becomes, do we really want to? Um, recreate all of that logic in inside of Dapper. Um, yeah, so that's that I think is, is a question that we're going to need to answer. So uh, David says, would be interesting if the service invocation API was extended to include the policy in the payload, much like Poly. So uh, David, we have that on the state API, for example. So when we said um, that this can either be a user code concern or a Dapper concern, what we mean is that you can um, you can take the the state retry policy that we have, with, where we only have it on state, and really apply it to all of the Dapper API. So yeah, service invocation is one of them. Um, so David, if I get you correctly, you're basically saying implement it in in Dapper. And Joseph S says exactly, can it work with Poly? So. Um, it can work with poly. I mean, if Dapper implements um, retries on its own, then you'll have, I guess, two layers of retries, right? So Dapper will have a retry policy where it tries to save the state to the state store or publish a message. And um, if you enable poly on the user code side, you'll have retries in case the call to Dapper fails. So I think um, it's like a, a double resiliency type of stuff where your application code is, is retrying with errors trying to contact Dapper, and Dapper does the retries in terms of the operation that it's trying to fulfill. Yeah, also the question here is really is, do you want to uh, leave the retry logic to libraries like Poly, or do you want Dapper to implement a similar logic in the runtime instead of having two layers? Uh, David, do you want to get unmuted, maybe? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm conflicted on this one because, you know, there's plenty of libraries out there and we don't want Dapper to turn into the one thing that does everything. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not, it's not hard to add, um, you know, circuit breaker and retry and all that. So it's, it's a conflicting thing, but if it is added, it's, I think a simple metadata on the, on the payload is one, add too much friction. Obviously it's a breaking change for service to service, but it's easy to, to use. Yeah, it's not necessarily a breaking change because it might be an additive section on the payload. So if you don't bring it there, just won't be a retry policy. Um, but yeah, I hear you. So, do, do you, so you think we should lean more towards leaving that as a user side concern? It's a tough one. Um, I'm used to, you know, relying on other libraries for that already. So I don't really need it. Um, yeah, that's kind of leaning that's, towards that, keeping it lean. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more thoughts? Anyone? Okay, I think I think uh, if there's no comments right now. Oh, I see something from Kenny and Kasun. Uh, Kenny says I prefer retry logic to stay inside Dapper, perhaps supporting ability to bypass in the rare case I need to overwrite, less user code to go wrong. Um, yeah. And then Kasun says uh, he thinks it's better to leave it as a part of Dapper. Um, okay, yes. Yeah, so I see. Um, yeah, you guys are just as conflicted about this as us, <laughs> as, we, as we are. So yeah, that's okay. Um, some more thinking to be done on this. 
Right. Okay, so I have a proposal uh, open here. I'll paste the issue in the chat here and maybe like we can continue this discussion on Gitter or feel free to add your thoughts on the proposal as well. Yeah, so Lynn is, is currently split. Um, Matt says if free trail logic is added internally, it would be best to keep it very simple. More complex needs should be application level concern. I personally tend to agree with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. This, is a, this is a conflicting thing uh, for sure. So how, how do we describe very simple retry logic, which is not configurable and things like that? So, okay, okay, we're, we're getting a swarm of responses here. <laughs> uh, yeah, people are... That's great. So Anthony says we have both Java and .NET. Would be nice to get rid of resiliency per language and have Dapper handle it in a language neutral way. Uh, yeah, for sure. If you're running multi um, program languages, for sure, inside of Dapper will make your lives mm -hmm. easier in, in that sense. Uh, how about the overlap with service mesh? Ah, Kasun, so this is something that I really want to talk about. Um, service meshes give you a per endpoint retry policy. Um, and Dapper can give you a per call retry policy. Um, I always give this example. Think if you're trying to consume a list of movies from a movie database and you're consuming, you know, one, um, let's say one movie, you, you know, with a query parameter of one, you might want to, you know, retry once for 10 milliseconds because that's normal SLA. But now if you're querying for a thousand movies, you know, with a, like a query parameter, of get me a thousand items, you might want that retry to be different. So that's the, the, the really big difference between how Dapper can allow you to have per call retries in, in regards to a service mesh, which is just a per endpoint and doesn't go really into the granularity of the business logic call that you're trying to make. Great. Um, I, think, I think with that, we'll maybe kind of continue this uh, either on the proposal, that, that's the issue that uh, Vinaya kind of pasted in the chat or over Gitter. Uh, so thank you everybody for voicing your opinions. Like that's exactly how um, we want to kind of build Dapper, right? With this kind of feedback in mind. So thank you, and let's continue that uh, over GitHub and uh, get get a good uh, policy that fits your your needs and your opinions. Yeah, um, it seems like there's that, a consensus around Matt here also. So Matt, um, if you want to chime into the issue in the GitHub uh, repository, that'd be great. And all of you, really, we'd, we'd love to continue the discussion. Uh, hey, Ori. Hey, Yaron, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I think it would be good to implement a simple retry logic in Dapper runtime. Um, and I think more than that, like adding a resiliency pattern uh, would not be suitable for Dapper runtime because some of those resiliency patterns are not per call basis. They are on... Uh, on, 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 on amount of calls over a time period. So the, so implementing whole resiliency patterns in Dapper would not make sense, but maybe some retries on per call, uh, they are better suitable inside Dapper. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's where the spirit is heading, yeah. Okay, so with that, uh, let's kick it over to, to Mark to, for a little demo. Thanks, Dory. I'm going to try to uh, share my screen. Tell me if you can see everything. Can you see it? Yes, we see it. Yeah, we can. All right. Uh, so if you have been to the um, Dapper binding page recently, you, you see a growing list of different bindings that we have provided. But as uh, one or two users recently pointed out, some of the basic uh, capability of scheduling a reoccurring call to a particular method that you have uh, on, a, on a predefined schedule is something that we didn't have. So in the latest release of Dapper in zero, uh, zero 09, we've added the capability to uh, provide a scheduler or a cron if you're coming from a more uh, Unix-like environment where you can provide, uh, uh, define a simple binding to the very same way you've done it before and define a simple schedule which would execute the method that, um, that's gonna be associated with the name. What we have done here is provided a uh, kind of an extension on this basic cron that you've seen, for example, in Linux, 
uh, where you have a minute, hour, day, month, and a day of the week. We've extended this to seconds and then provided uh, basically uh, parity with the Chrome tabs that you can define in Linux. So you can use the current execution every 30 minutes or every 15 minutes. We do have support for time zones. So if you are specific, if you want to um, this uh, call to your code to be executed at a specific time in the specific time zone, you can also define that. And uh, we also provide a couple of shortcuts. So in, in this case, we have support for the every 15 minutes or 15 seconds or 15 hours and daily and hourly kind of shortcuts. So that should be all available in there. How you use that in real life is um, in, if you're, you've defined any uh, components before, uh, you've, you've seen the bindings that work the same way. In this case, you name your component, you can provide additional namespace if you're working in an environment uh, that, that's in, important. And then uh, using the simple uh, value for schedulers, you can define your schedule. What that will do is when Dopper starts is we will look for a path called run in your code. So let's see what that implementation look like. I have a simple demo in Go here. Uh, there's not many languages I, I can write, but Go I can. Um, so uh, what we have to do here, just like with any bindings, Dopper uh, will expect you to support an options. Uh, Dopper will not start bombarding you with number of posts until you declare that you are able to support those kind of functionality. Um, so we have a simple a simple route for uh, posts uh, in options, and then we have a post uh, support for run. So in options, basically all you have to do is just make sure that uh, if you're using some kind of frameworks or if you're using one of our SDKs, that might already be handled for you. Uh, but in your user code, you really don't have to, you know, you, you can do as much as you want to do in this particular case, but this is the code that's going to be invoked uh, by Dapper in a pre-occurring schedule. So let's maybe run a quick, um, quick run. We we'll run, uh, uh, execute a Dapper run command like we do normally with an application ID, the protocol, in this case, HTTP and the port number. We'll provide a path to the directory where we have that cron file. And I'm going to use debug in here just because I want to see some of the things both from the component uh, side of Dapper as well as my user code. So let's let's run it. And oops, started already. So one of the things I want to maybe back up a little here. Uh, what's going to happen is uh, there's a couple of things. Dapper first of all is going to run options on that run command, and if it's successful, then it says, "Okay, your code can execute post." Now let me start scheduling. And our our schedule, if you remember in here, was um, every three seconds. So uh, every three seconds, Dapper will do a post to that path. It's a simple functionality, but it's amazing how powerful that can be if you start kind of providing an extensions or start running some re reoccurring reports or anything like that. Um, um, in the, if, if the debug mode would not be there, you would not see the, um, you would not see ni neither of these messages, both uh, either from Dapper itself or from uh, the user code in here. So um, I'm going to stop this before it starts overflowing. Uh, but basically, that's the entire functionality. It's pretty simple um, to write. You can do this in Node.js, Python, or anything else. You, you just have to make sure your options are supported. If options are not supported, Dapper will check the options, uh, but then not do the subsequent posts. So that's pretty much it. We have uh, provided documentation for how you can define these schedules. Uh, there is a link to uh, for more information about the, the kind of construct of what the meaning of, of crons uh, is in, in a programming environment if you need to learn a little more about it. Um, what we are looking into is also you know, subsequent releases to provide a support for program, programming, programmable, I guess is the word, a way of stopping, for example, um, uh, through an output uh, uh, binding to stop an existing schedule or maybe even do something else. So if you have some thoughts on this topic, love to hear your opinions. I'm gonna switch area. That's pretty much for all for binding. If you have any questions, uh, I'm not seeing any here. For some reasons, my comments went away, but let me know if you have any questions on Chrome. If not, I'm gonna switch to the next topic and I'm gonna use slides for this one just because this is still in the early stages of thinking. Is, hey Mark, um, I have a quick question regarding regarding Chrome since it's uh, since it's Chrome. Um, so if if a user app has multiple replicas, will it invoke on all the replicas? Uh, can you can you elaborate on the replicas? 
So it, if if I'm running in Kubernetes and my uh, application has multiple oh, got replicas, it. yeah. Got it. So so this is driven by Dapper. You think about Dapper doing post to a um, uh, to your application it, uh, from the sidecar. Uh, so every instance of that that every instance of your code that has a sidecar will uh, execute that binding. Okay, Let's so user. Have... Okay, so user code needs to take care of it. Okay, and second question is: This binding uh, is the information persisted? Let's say I, I say run it after five hours every day. Um, is this thing persisted, or when pod starts again, it will start the counter from the beginning again? That's a good point. Yes, it's not. There is no uh, out of process persistence. So this is all okay. based on the life cycle of, of the pod. Yeah. If uh, that, that's actually an interesting option we can provide combining the the uh, binding with something like a state to persist that state across uh, res uh, the to make it durable so that if Dapper sidecar uh, was restarted or instance was updated that state could potentially be persistent. Uh, it's an interesting idea. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, so I'm going to switch to. Thank you. Um, I'm going to switch to cloud events um, and talk a little more about the Dapper's use of cloud events. Cloud events is uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation or CNCF. You've seen us talked about this before. Specification for um, describing events data, kind of trying to define a lingua franca for a way of communicating events. So today, um, if you already worked with Dapper before, you're already familiar with the notion of being able to submit or post content to our pops up APIs. Uh, in this case, a simple message to a topic called messages. What Dapper then would do, uh, uh, would use the exist, uh, would basically create an envelope, cloud event envelope, to take that message, populate into the data, and uh, define its type, and associate a bunch of additional data, creating a unique ID, and make sure that we have a source of the application ID, and then we also, prov like injecting a, a trace uh, ID in here for ability to pass this context of the request. Um, so this was uh, this is what has been up to uh, Dapper 008 um, and, and kind of works like this today too. But if you were to take that JSON then and uh, existing cloud event and repost that event to our to that same topic again, what Dapper would have done before is would have taken that content, wrapped it yet into another envelope and another envelope. So you quickly could have gotten to pretty deeply nested message and it would probably um, we haven't heard specific issues with this just because I'm not sure people are depending on cloud events uh, yet too much. But with the growing popularity of cloud events, we wanted to make sure that we don't do that. So there's no expectations from the developer with regards to how that uh, content looks like. So uh, we're happy to announce that with this current release, uh, the Dapper handling actually is going to uh, understand the fact that you are posting existing cloud event. It's going to not try to uh, wrap it into another envelope, but kind of use it as is and pass the content to it. So that's kind of what's already in Dapper 09 that is current that was released this week. Sorry, last week. Um, what are we are talking about? And I want to make sure that this is uh, clear. This is work in progress, and we have a couple issues open against uh, the area, both uh, with regards to uh, persisting the original subscri topic subscription as well as uh, providing events in the latest version of cloud events, which is 1.0. You will see the issues on the top of the screen here. But what we are thinking about is the ab ability to, first of all, update the, our support for cloud events to 1.0. So if you have any existing logic that is dependent on that version being 0.3, uh, it, we want, you want to kind of be aware of that, that that update is coming. Uh, and uh, the rest of the content it looks uh, at the minimum implementation is already compatible with the version 1.0 format, but we want to kind of leverage a couple of the new existing capabilities to enrich the data. So uh, first of all, we're going to be also supporting or we're considering potentially supporting the, uh, the time uh, component, which or type, type field, which would allow um, uh, the original poster of cloud events to, for example, communicate the, when that event has happened, not when Dapper received that event, uh, and then use the extensions uh, feature inside of cloud events to be very explicit about the type of things that we kind of are uh, populating into the uh, user data right now. So topic, uh, the original topic is the place, uh, the issue 1786 talks about that uh, situation where we kind of losing the topic um, name in case of a um, 
uh, wildcard supported for something like a RabbitMQ. Uh, we also uh, would be more explicit about the trace ID uh, and the app ID that uh, is uh, initiated, initiated that event. Um, th this is, again, these are proposals. We have, um, we have open issues specifically for the 1.0 uh, update, it's 16.16, easy to remember. Love to hear your uh, thoughts on those topics and any additional comments with regards to event uh, st streaming and event uh, kind of handling in Dapper. That's it. Thank you, Mark. Um, any feedback right now? Any thoughts on this? Feel free to again raise your hand or put a comment in the chat. If, Cloud uh, events, I think, is, is still kind of, um, well, it's not very new, but I think it's new to people still. Um, is anyone here using Cloud events in one way or form? We'd love to know. So I take it that no. <laughs> one of the, uh, one of the uh, drivers, perhaps, for why Dapper is even supporting Cloud events, there's a growing number of uh, sys services and uh, cloud services or cloud providers uh, systems that generate events with that format already by default. And if you were to kind of, as this list of services grows, we want to make sure that if you were by default attaching to it, we can make sure that we kind of supporting the same format. It seems to be, uh, like I said, CNCF st standardized way that's evolving uh, uh, pretty rapidly. So it's a good way to kind of uh, uh, leverage the existing standards to provide a very consistent way of wrapping those events. Exactly, like event grid uh, David mentioned over here. Okay, so I think we're done with the uh, uh, kind of structured agenda at this point. We have uh, a little over 10 minutes. Uh, let's open it up for general Q&A uh, feedback questions, feature requests, um, anything on your mind, would love to hear it. So again, raise your hand to be unmuted or put your comments in the chat. Um, yeah, and thanks everyone for the great discussion about the retries. Yeah, absolutely. We can continue it, by the way, if there's nothing else. Okay. Oh, okay, here I see Kenny has a question. Can you describe how components are handled in the three different options? Default, my minus slim, my minus k. Are all components stored locally at init or are they pulled from a repo as needed or do I need to install them manually in slim mode? You're on, you want uh, to take is, that? Is, is McClendon on the call maybe? Uh, yep. Hey, uh, yes. So for the slim mode, uh, what we have is, okay, uh, let me talk about the default in it first and then I'll uh, uh, go into the slim mode. So for the default in it, the components that are downloaded for uh, when Docker is available uh, and containerized is basically the Dapper placement service, the Redis component, and also the Zipkin component with tracing enabled by default uh, for local development. So this is what happens during the normal default initializations. Uh, so when you give the uh, hyphen hyphen slim option or dash s option, what happens is uh, none of these components are downloaded uh, in a containerized form and only the two binaries, the dapper d binary and the placement binary are downloaded. So uh, if you need to run, so uh, by default, you could run the uh, uh, service invocation with the Dapper D binary uh, installed. And there, if you run the placement service also with a state store enabled, that's another thing. You need to configure a state store locally. So you would need to install uh, some form of uh, state store locally and start it. For example, you could probably install uh, Redis server locally and configure the component 
uh, in either the default components uh, directory or you can configure it as a separate uh, 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 file in your app location under a components directory and give the path to that. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah and also so for, for Dapper and Kubernetes, we're not installing anything on the Kubernetes cluster. He also asked about uh, init dash dash k. Oh, yeah, yeah, init dash dash k, yes. Uh, dash dash Kubernetes, we are not installing uh, any components at all. Yeah, I, I guess let me maybe. Go ahead, Mark. I just said, I think it's interesting I just to make sure that you understand the scenarios for these. The default one is just to have a set up a development environment for you and because of the ease of setting up the development environment for you it does have a dependency on docker containers the idea of slim was that we started getting asks can i install dapper without docker dependencies and basically this is the minimal installment of dapper without any docker dependencies if you just want to use the executable so just think of it like that but if you do that it doesn't set up a great development environment for you so there may be other occasions where you just want dapper on a set of <laughs> where you don't need docker dependencies so it's so a default Dapper and it is still the suggested way to set up yes. a developer and machine. Yes. Slim was just to show you how you don't have to have a Docker dependency. If you to use executables, you can because Dapper isn't dependent on Docker if you want to run it. But given that Redis was used as a local cache for development, ease of use, Zipkin is now put there for development, ease of use, and they're easy to install as containers. Uh, people kind of got the impression that Dapper was tied to Need the need for Docker containers when it's not. So the Slim just shows here's the minimum executables that Dapper can put on the machine if all you want is executables without Docker dependency. Scenarios maybe it were just like you're an operator and you want to put Dapper in the middle of environments and you've already done all your testing and development elsewhere and you know you're just wanting to put this on a say a set of VMs that you're you're deploying Dapper to or maybe IoT Edge one day where you don't need necessarily oh well that's actually that's different. Don't ignore that. Make, make sense. Uh, yes, Kenny. Kenny. Need to find you in the sea of people. <laughs> Can you, oh, here you are. Kenny. Sorry, I had hardware mute. <clears throat> so thanks for those answers. That makes sense. And, and I think the, the confusion that I have is, is maybe over the word install. So there's a, there's a plethora of components that I can leverage. My question is, how, like, are those components available to me to actually leverage, like let's say in a YAML file, automatically as soon as I initialize? Or is there some sort of, uh, that, that's really what I'm asking, not, not something that's spun up like a Redis store being spun up, but the actual component, the binary code. So just to see if I understand your question, uh, I think there's like three elements when we say kind of components, there's the, the actual, like if it's like a Redis or the actual Redis running, there's the, the YAML file that configures Dappers to use it, and, and there's the Dapper piece of code that does the, comp the component work. So you're yes, asking that, about the third thing. The third right? one. Yeah. yeah I, so think you're you're thinking, thinking, I think your answer to this is all the components gets, that we ship in each release get um, statically bound into the single executable. So that you just create the YAML file and put it into the components directory of your choice, and then that's how you use it. So okay. all the components are available for you in every release. Okay, so yeah. regardless, regardless of the init method, they're, they're statically bound and available, all of them. Correct. Yep. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, the, the init flow is really, again, for us to kind of provide mostly new users uh, for, to have like a really good starting point in terms of the development environment that we think is like a recommended way to do it. Of course, you can do anything yourself, and um, and just to remove the friction for some people who have friction with Docker, we now just have the ability to spin that up without that environment. But that's all. In terms of component usage, there's no difference in the um, methods. Yeah, and okay. I think Kasun had a question about the Chrome job and Chrome. 
Yeah, March 1. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to find where was this question? The question is uh, Is there a specific use of cron in DAPA compared to cron job in Kubernetes? Um, so, uh, so the, the scheduling format, the, the frequency format would be the same, but uh, the scheduling, uh, cr uh, sorry, the, um, the cron job in, in Kubernetes is guaranteed over the restart of the lifecycle of the container. Uh, uh, like was pointed out by Aman, we don't, we don't have that right now. So this is only during the, side, the life cycle of the side, Dapper sidecar. But otherwise, pretty much, pretty much the same. Right, but if, if the pod is restarted, so will the cron job. I mean, so will the, during the, the during, during the, yeah, in Dapper right now, yes. Yeah, yeah. Because if you have a cron job calling a pod and then the pod is down, then the, the call from the cron job to the pod will not succeed anyway in a cron job. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually creating an issue. I was creating an issue right now um, in Dapper to just propose uh, adding the state to the cron job so we can persist that if you already think, have a state um, component defined. For me, uh, one of the major differences is that you can run a Dapper cron anywhere, so not just in Kubernetes. So in any environment, really, on IoT Edge, on your machine, um, outside of Kubernetes, really. So for example, you might use the Dapper cron binding to develop locally and then move on to a cron job on Kubernetes to get that local development experience without needing to run a Kubernetes cluster locally. Um, yeah, and mainly the fact that it can really run anywhere and be decoupled from the um, underlying platform. Yeah, I think the, the use cases that I kind of tried to demo with in my mind was that you can actually, like by itself, the scheduler is kind of interesting, but not. <laughs> uh, you, you, can you can run some code uh, every once in a while that, that, that probably is limited in functionality. But if you combine it with all the other things that you have already have in Dapper, now you can suddenly say, hey, I want to rerun um, like a document scans in my repository that were already saved or something or you can uh, resubmit ex external binding on a predefined schedule. So call some external API using the uh, HTTP binding that we already have. So there's a number of different use cases where you can combine that and create it a little more, uh, a little more interesting. So I think that's kind of where the uh, innovative portion is gonna come in. In addition to the ability to run anywhere that Yaron already mentioned. Great. Looks like we got two more minutes. If anybody has one last question. If not, feel free to always use Gitter, use uh, GitHub to you know discuss things on open issues or open new issues and proposals. Um, and I guess we're also available on Twitter as well. Uh, Okay, so with that, let's conclude this community call. Thank you again for joining. We know it's just summer, so some people are taking some time off. We really appreciate your time. Great discussion. Let's continue those things on retries and uh, and other things uh, over GitHub and Gitter. Um, thank you. Thanks again. <laughs>